and we got nine people. <laughs> Ten. We'll give it a minute, okay? We do have 110 people registered. Right? I'm expecting quite a few more. Uh, good evening, everyone. Or is it evening? It's dark in here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to uh, another episode of uh, George Moy's World, also known as the Asian American Executive Network uh, webinar. And today we really have a, a wonderful guest, a, a set of guests from uh, IAF, and they'll tell you more about IAF. But we, uh, I want to introduce our co-host in a few minutes, which is National Ace. And uh, while we are waiting for more people to attend, well, 24, that's pretty fast, 25. Uh, I don't know, I want to introduce my business partner, the regional J-Lo. Um, I don't know, is that a good joke, J Jenny? The regional J-Lo, uh, she's also a, uh, a uh, consultant in National Ways, helping with event planning. Uh, we brought National Way on, on as part of this effort of introducing IF to not only to cover the Midwest, but entire nation. So uh, we're looking forward to um, to your participation through chat box and I'll attempt to uh, have the speaker answer all the questions. If not, we'll make sure we follow up. But let's see how many people we have here. 33, let's, let's wait to uh, a couple more minutes. I just wanna let you know that um, uh, this uh, will be recorded. It's done in a webinar format, as you can tell. If you're a participant, you could participate through chat. Uh, obviously you could look at or the speaker, you could text us privately or publicly, or you could chat each other. And um, we will record this, which also include all the chat. And some of the speaker will be giving you more information with the chat box, so you could take a look at them. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and give you an idea of what we're gonna do today. Uh, Asian American Center, we are a, actually a very informal networking group, uh, but we've been in a system for about 10 years. So we have really, I say a powerful network. Uh, more importantly, where we're a powerful set of uh, executives who wanted the time and effort to make the Asian American Accept Network program meaningful to whatever that we feel like are the issue at hand that's not being covered by uh, uh, Asian American organizations. And we tend to collaborate a lot uh, with Asian American organizations, in this case, National ACE. They have a national coverage, National Asian Chamber. Uh, but we, we have covered many topics uh, over the years. This year we did 11 webinar, section on small business, um, talking, uh, celebrating the healthcare workers. And, but you have to wait for the best event, which is in December, which is our holiday celebration. It's always the biggest uh, party that we have uh, <coughs> in the Asian community. So uh, look for my email. I, I know now you have received too many emails from me already. But with that said, I'm gonna go ahead into a very special guest. Um, I also happen to be uh, a uh, member of the board of director for IFF. And Joe Neri, uh, our CEO of IF, I invited him to share some of his perspective on IF. And then his team member will actually share the program and uh, services. Joe, welcome and thank you for your support of the Asian community. Joe. Absolutely. So. Good, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you so much, George, for obviously um, it has been an absolute pleasure that you've joined us on IFF's board, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but also certainly arranging this um, and inviting IFF to be, be a part of um, this presentation. I think uh, many of you may un, uh, know IFF already, but many of you may not, and, and, and that is um, something that uh, George and I have talked a lot about changing. Um, so I want to just briefly talk about um, who IFF is, and then you will hear from my amazing staff, uh, Gordon Helwig and um, Kate Ansorg, who've been with IFF for uh, many years, about our work in a much more deep way. But IFF is um, used to be the Illinois Facilities Fund. Um, we're not that anymore. We haven't been that for about 15 years. And part of that is that we serve the entire Midwest region of the US. We have a large um, home base uh, office here in Chicago, but we have offices throughout the Midwest. So Kansas City, St. Louis, Milwaukee, Indianapolis, um, Columbus, Ohio, and then our second largest office uh, is in Detroit, 
which has expanded um, from two people just six years ago to uh, now about 20 staff members as well. And so our goal is, um, as a community development financial institution, has always been about making sure that capital is available to nonprofit organizations serving low income um, communities and persons with disabilities. And again, throughout the Midwest. Part of our mission is making sure that capital is available to help nonprofits thrive. In addition to being a lender for community facilities, we're also a real estate consultant and we help nonprofits um, plan and implement facilities projects of all types. So Gordon and, and Kate are gonna um, speak more deeply about that. But I wanted to just take uh, one second to talk about IFF strategic plan. And that's really in many ways how I met George and how um, I and team appear to you today. Part of, or one of the foundational planks of our strategic plan, which we're about two years into now, is to very much push our outreach to diverse communities throughout the Midwest. And frankly, while we have always had a diverse um, market and group of borrowers and clients for our real estate services, we needed to do much better. And so we made a challenge as part of the strategic plan to do that. And that started at the very top by um, recruiting board members like George um, to really assist us to, out, to do the outreach and to deeply um, reach out to agencies that we may not have touched in the past. And so this is a, an amazing opportunity to do that work. But I want you to know that we really are deeply committed to making that happen. And this may be one of the first steps. It certainly will not be the last. And, and I think since you all know George, you know he is not going to um, allow us to get away with a one-time uh, one presentation. And I am glad that he won't because this, this is extremely important to us. And this outreach and making sure that our products and our services are available throughout the Midwest uh, to um, agencies of all types is extremely important to us, to us. So thank you very much for your participation today. And certainly I'm going to be available if you have direct questions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the chat box as well. George? Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. It's, um, it took Joe two years to get me. And I uh, refused to answer his call because I don't know his number for four months until my fellow board member, Joe Gomez said, why the heck are you not answering Joe's call? I said, who's Joe? Anyway, that's uh, George in his typical self. But anyway, what I wanted to share with you is the, um, oh, whoa, who's this Karen person? Can you show your face, Karen? I, I, I can't speak to just a name, Karen. Oh, there you go. <laughs> sorry, sorry to put you on the sorry. spot, Karen. Karen happened to be a very good friend of mine and is uh, one of the co-founder of Asian American Executive Network. We've been doing this for about 10 years. She's always hosting events. And just so happens, she's also the chairperson of National Ace. And you could see why, you know, we, I partner with National Ace quite a bit in addition to J. Lo. But uh, Karen, thank you. You have any couple of words you want to say? I know you, uh, are you driving? This is bad. This is bad, right? You should be driving and doing Zoom at the same time. It says, I'm in the line at the Starbucks drive through because I have a coffee coffee date okay, after I'm this. Nice <laughs> Want to say a couple of words to, to welcome all, all your folks? Hey, you know, I'm really excited that um, we're doing this collaboration with IFF because it's always great to have um, organizations that the community is not quite as familiar with um, get together and learn about as well as they can learn more about us and our community and how engaged we are. So I'm really appreciative that you were able to bring it all together. You've been working on this pretty hard, uh, both George and Janie, so, and, and the ACE team. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. All right, I'm going on thank to you. Karen. Okay, thank you. And um, what, speaking of ACE, I wanna introduce um, the ACE team. Where is she? Oh, there she is. 
sorry, I'm, I'm looking at my box. <laughs> Janet is uh, representing ACE today. She's a uh, program manager in uh, National ACE. Um, so she's gonna, on behalf of NASA, welcome you and uh, say a few words about National ACE. And she's also gonna introduce her partner, Shirlyn Chan from AARP. Janet, you on. Hi, George. Thank you all so much for having us on this program today. Um, I'm also, I know the background is deceiving. I actually am from Chicago as well. So I want to give a quick shout out to the Chicago, everybody representing Chicago today. Thank you for being here. Uh, again, my name is Janet Alekpala, and I'm the program manager for the Asian Pacific Islander American Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship. I know it's a long title, but it's also known as National ACE. I'm honored to speak with all of you today, and I'm looking forward to listening to today's discussion on strengthening AAPI nonprofits, which is very important to understand and learn about the leadership, capital, and real estate solutions that are out there. National ACE has a wonderful opportunity to have strong partnerships with the Asian American Executive Network and AARP, who help contribute to the advancements of AAPI nonprofits locally and regionally. I also wanna share with you now some information about National ACE. We're a national nonprofit whose mission is to serve as a strong advocate of AAPI business interests and to help affect positive change on all issues that enhance and advance the goals and aspirations of AAPI business owners. For the past few months, we've worked closer than ever with our national network of over 60 affiliate chambers across the country to ensure that the AAPI business community has the most accurate and up-to-date information about the important resources that are available to our community during this global pandemic. We're thankful to longtime friends and consultants of National ACE, George Moy of the Asian American Executive Network and Jani Lowe, who also represents the White House Initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And she is also the CEO of Golden Catalyst LLC. So we thank them for helping us connect these important organizations today for this discussion and allowing for all of us to have an interactive forum on this very important discussion. Stay tuned because our organizations are still working together very hard on additional collaborations in the near future and beyond. As many of you know, we are just beginning to see the data on the impact of COVID-19 and what it has done to the AAPI business community. Our recent report by JP Morgan Chase shows that the balances of Asian owned businesses declined by 22% in early April and at the end of March, revenues for AAPI businesses were over 60% lower than they were in the prior year. Overall, Asian-owned businesses have experienced severe damage to cash balances and revenues, and they're going to require assistance from the federal government to fully recover. As many federal assistance programs have since stalled, we know that additional targeted interventions will be necessary for the small business community uh, to just you know, survive because they're struggling very hard right now. National ACE has instituted a program to help tackle many of these issues, including helping individual businesses with financial assistance, as well as helping individual businesses restart their operations safely and strategically. If your business or nonprofit is in need of free one-on-one -on -one consulting or other resources, please contact us through our website at acesmallbusiness.org. I will put that in the chat box. Um, we have hired certified uh, business consultants that are ready and willing to help all business entrepreneurs and executive directors of nonprofits at any level. And best of all, our services are free of charge and we're here to help. Again, a big thank you to George, Janny, Dennis, Shenlin, and Joe and his team at IFF Chicago for hosting this event today. We're really looking forward to hearing about this great discussion. Thanks again. Okay, you want to go ahead and introduce uh, Shenlin, the uh, AAP folks? Yes, and I'd like to also introduce, thank you, George, Shenlin Chen of AARP. Thank you. Okay, you're on. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, good. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, thank you to National A's for your invitation and also your facil uh, facilitate um, for your leadership in our community, especially during this uh, devastating financial crisis resulting from COVID. ARP is very pleased to be able to support and partner with you to assist as we can to help uh, the API small business, uh, which we all know are the key uh, economic engineer uh, engines, you know, for our community. Uh, API is the net, uh, the net, like a national organization, and we are the nation's largest nonprofit 
nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people age 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. We have a nearly uh, 38 million members nationwide and 1.3 million here in Michigan. And we have committed to strengthening community and advocating for uh, what matter most to families such as health, uh, like health security, financial stability and personal fulfillment. And the AAPI Michigan has been deeply engaged in helping the community uh, during the pandemic since March. And we have also been engaging voter engagement efforts. And as you know, Michigan is one of the six battleground states in the uh, presidential election. So there's a lot of work to do. And some of our priority issues that we're advocating, including social security, like preserving social security, uh, social security for both current and future beneficiaries and cutting uh, prescription drug prices for all Americans and protect Medicare from benefit cuts, lower healthcare costs, and also ensure seniors to continue receiving affordable uh, healthcare services, um, you know, which they have learned, have, they have earned. And then make sure seniors have access to safe and affordable long-term uh, long care at home, as well as in facilities such as uh, nursing homes or assisted living. And then we also help Americans over 50 uh, to overcome economic recovery, you know, to, and then uh, that uh, would uh, impact by the coronavirus. So as we all know, COVID and, uh, had a big impact on small business, you know, and it is really devastating. And you may, you may know, you, you may have known that uh, in year 2018, 25.8% uh, new business were started by people 50 to 64 years old. And as a result of COVID-19, 18% of the older entrepreneurs of small business have been impacted. And this is why AARP is and has been involved with small business. And one thing a, uh, AARP Michigan did in the past couple of years is that we partner with small business, including local chambers of commerce and the state of Michigan to de uh, develop a program called Experience for Hire. That helps match small business who are looking for uh, qualified employees with certain skill sets, uh, with older workers who have you know, those skills and maybe looking for a new role or a job in targeted com uh, local communities. And we also regularly connect with uh, and have really appreciate the opportunity to partner with the Small Business Association of Michigan and other small business leaders uh, on legislative advocacy uh, when we have a common interest, for example, regarding uh, healthcare costs. And uh, nationwide um, or on a national level, we have a campaign landing page that offers resources on how to start business from you know, financial, legal, timing, preparing business or marketing plan, type of cost and type of loans. You know, on that page, current owners or sm uh, small business owner can sign up to participate in our developing LinkedIn uh, newsletter where we will profile small business owners. So AARP is a national organization, but we do have state offices. And through partnership with uh, National A's, um, our, our state offices, you know, like Michigan, can connect with your local chambers and to support each other. So really, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sean Lin. So one of the things that um, I've been doing advocacy for almost 40 years, uh, first 25 or so on corporate, work on um, mostly corporate uh, environment, how AAPI can support uh, the corporation and get rewarded. So the last 10 years, I've been focusing on uh, small business, as some of you know, working for Department of Commerce. But often missing is the uh, knowledge of what's happening with the Asian American nonprofit. All of them work very hard, do a very good job in achieving the missions, but oftentimes their own self uh, well being as an organization often uh, ignore not only because they don't know about the services that uh, Joe and his team is uh, offering and government services. And what I, uh, when I spent the last few years at the White House University, we were getting a lot of potential funding for, uh, for different, like the BP oil spill. 
we ha actually have trouble finding Asian American organization that has capacity and size to receive some of this grant. And the more we dig into it, the more we realize that most of the honest are won by people who are passionate for the mission they are, they are already dedicated to. But oftentimes they don't have enough resources to have financial planning, capital planning, to build the capacity needed. So um, walking in a size about working with Joe, once I know what Joe and his honor is providing, I felt like I need to be there to help him outreach to Asian American nonprofit who can send benefit, if anything, knowing what service available and make the decision. And most of the folks I try to get to, to come to the event is not necessarily the nonprofit staff because they're so busy, is the board members who are supporting nonprofit. And we have a whole lot of those in our network. But today, what I wanna do is make sure that we give time to the speaker to talk about the partner services, but more importantly for you as a participant to think about how you can apply these to your, your nonprofit that you are working with. And we do know that that's because of national age, national coverage, we have about 25% of you are outside of the Midwest, but we are committed uh, as Gordon will tell you, that we're gonna connect you to the organization, similar IF in your area. With that said, I'm gonna introduce, introduce you Gordon, Managing Director of Illinois and uh, Northwest Indiana. And he's gonna take the lead in uh, giving you some idea on what IF is doing. Gordon, you're on. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Um, and I wanna thank uh, the Asian American Executive Network and National ACE for sponsoring this and giving me and, and the rest of uh, uh, the, the, the folks on the panel, the opportunity to talk about IFF and what we do. Um, IFF is a, we're a mission-driven community development financial institution, as Joe mentioned. Um, and we work with not-for-profit organizations almost exclusively. I'll mention a couple of uh, uh, for-profit exceptions later on in my remarks. But um, I want everyone to know that the, we work with not-for-profit organizations. We are a not-for-profit ourselves. And I wanna make sure that everyone who's with a not-for-profit understands that there's a, an option if you're looking for lending, if you're looking for capital, or if you're looking for real estate consulting advice. Um, uh, my colleague Kate will talk about the real estate consulting that we provide. I'm on the lending side of IFF, so that's what uh, I would like to talk to or talk about today. But you can see the diagram um, that's shown here shows the different uh, uh, areas in which IFF works with not-for-profit organizations through lending and finance, real estate development and consulting. We do research and it's all, and we do public policy but it's all built around the notion that we want to strengthen not-for-profit organizations so that they can strengthen the work that they do and expand the work that they do in communities, low-income communities, and persons with disabilities. That's what IFF, uh, that's what our mission is. And uh, it's a passion, I'm passionate about the work that we do and I am delighted to be here to talk to you today. Um, Emily, if I could have the next slide. So this is about the loan products that we provide. And as George mentioned, I'm the managing director of lending for uh, Illinois and Northwest Indiana. I'm based in Chicago. We have several other lenders uh, in the market that, uh, that I'm in, but we have lenders in all of the offices that, that uh, Joe had mentioned earlier. All of the seven offices that we have uh, across the upper Midwest do have lending offices or lending officers rather. And we provide a variety of loan products, but first let me patients that we support, not-for-profit organizations of all types. Um, and I'd just like to read a quick healthcare organizations, particularly federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, do a lot we do lending for charter schools, access to fresh and healthy foods, we do uh, lending for uh, education facilities, workforce development facilities, refugee assistance, we disabled adults and children. We provide capital for food pantries, 
We provide a lot of financing for theater groups, uh, performance organizations of for persons with disabilities is another sector that we work in. Behavioral health, housing uh, agencies that work with uh, finding homes for the homeless, the whole variety profits that work throughout the area that we work in. We want to strengthen those organizations. And one of the ways that we do that is through providing capital uh, via loans to those organizations. But what kind of loan products do we have? Um, we were started, as Joe mentioned, as the Illinois Facilities Fund 32 years ago. And at that time, we started making only facility loans, that is loans for real estate. If a not-for-profit was leasing space and decided it was better for them to buy a building, we could help them do that. If they wanted to uh, improve the building that they were in already, even if they didn't own it, we would provide leasehold mortgages, which is uh, something that banks typically are reluctant to do. Um, if the organization had the wherewithal and wanted to borrow in order to build a new building, we would provide financing for that as well. So we started initially just doing facilities loans We've expanded beyond that. We do equipment and uh, vehicle loans as well. Capital campaign bridge loans is a, is a large segment of the kind of lending that I do and that we all do for bridging those capital campaigns, if not for profits, are raising the funds, for example, to build a new building. If, you've got, uh, if you're raising capital from contributors or from philanthropy, or if you have grants from state or municipal or, go or federal government agencies, we can help you uh, realize your project before those funds come in by providing a bridge loan to, the, to bridge that capital campaign. We also do subordinate mortgage loans. I should mention, we work very closely with banks and we were created as what we call a gap lender. We're not trying to take our, uh, business away from banks. Banks are among our biggest supporters with investments and also lending money to IFF because they believe in our mission. So we don't want to be taking business away from them. And one of the first things I tell a prospective borrower, a not-for-profit, if they come to us, is have you talked to your bank about your project? And if it is, if it's something that a bank will do, we would typically encourage them to work with banks. But a lot of times, banks are unwilling to make loans to not-for-profit organizations. And certainly 32 years ago, when we were created, that was very much the case. And so we were created to fill that gap, to provide financing when banks were reluctant to, and banks are often still reluctant to lend to not-for-profit organizations. So we, we work with banks and that's where the subordinate mortgage loans come in. There may be a time when a bank is willing to make a loan, but it's not enough for a not-for-profit. They won't lend enough for a not-for-profit organization to realize its project. So we can come in uh, behind the bank with a subordinate mortgage take a second mortgage where the bank feels they're protected with a first mortgage. Um, we're there to provide the second mortgage and the, uh, the financing that is needed and the not-for-profit is able to realize the project, whether it's renovating a building or building a new one or buying one. Um, the lending amounts that we do range from $10,000 to up to $6 million. And we can even do loans greater than that. We have a number of partners that we can call upon if there were deals that we wanted to, uh, if a, a large not-for-profit had, a, had a project that exceeded the amount that we were able to lend or that we were comfortable lending, we have a lot of partners that we could draw in to, to assist with that. Our terms are uh, anywhere from a three-year loan for a bridge loan, interest-only loan while that capital campaign is being completed and the funds come in to our typical mortgage loan is 15 years, a fully amortizing loan although we will uh, extend that to a 20 year amortization depending on the cash flow, if it's going to assist the organization uh, to be able to make those payments. We are, as I mentioned, different from banks. We're not a bank, we don't take deposits. We do make loans um, and the loans that we make are, are differ in significant ways from those that banks make. For one thing, Banks are, are asset-based, they're collateral-based. If it's a, it's a piece of real estate, a bank is gonna wanna have an appraisal of that real estate and they have loan to value limits they typically will not exceed, for example, 75%. So if they determine that a building is gonna be worth a million dollars and a bank is willing to make the loan, 
they may lend only up to $750,000. We differ from that. We're willing to lend up to 95% of the project's costs, and we're not basing that on the appraised value or a loan to value based on an appraisal. We have never required appraisals, and we still don't unless the project, unless the loan is greater than $3 million. We are cash flow lenders, however, so we want to make sure by examining or by uh, going through the financial statements of the organization that they're going to be able to afford the loan uh, and not have to struggle in order to make those loan payments. So we are um, we look at the cash flow, we look at the financial statements of the organization, we look at the budget. See, we want to work with you to make sure that you're going to be able to uh, um, afford this loan and uh, make the payments. Um, we have no prepayment penalties, and we typically have no loan covenants. Those are both uh, uh, distinguishing characteristics that distinguish us from banks. Um, as I mentioned, we have affordable housing loans, and we also have some special financing projects. So uh, if I may have the next slide, Emily. And so we can assist clients not only with financing, but also with working with them on finding other sources of, of uh, funding, for example, grants uh, from uh, the state or municipal or from philanthropy. We can work with, with not-for-profit clients of ours, not only on the lending side, but also help them find other sources of funding that can go along with loans that IFF might be able to provide for the organizations. So I want to, uh, to conclude, and I will turn this over to Kate to talk about our real estate consulting services but I'd like everyone to leave knowing that IFF is there to work with not-for-profit organizations. And we wanna make sure that, uh, uh, that you're all aware of that. Uh, there are representatives from not-for-profits in the audience and all of you know people that are with not-for-profit organizations and we'd like to have the word out that IFF, we work all throughout the upper Midwest from Michigan to Missouri, from Kansas to Kentucky and all of those states to provide the kind of services that not-for-profits need, including loans. So Kate, if you'd like to take it. Thanks from Gordon. Um, so I just wanna take this moment to remind people to use the chat. So if you have questions as we're going along, we'll track the chat box um, and try and answer your questions through chat. Uh, but um, let's go ahead, Emily, to the next slide. So I just wanna start with, you know, why facilities? So we work with a lot of nonprofits and I find that sometimes um, really with best intentions that organizations put facilities as an afterthought. They're really focused on the, the programs they the immediate client need in a community and trying to get every dollar out to uh, make impact with the people they're working with, the community members, um, and that facilities can sometimes be something that they undervalue that they don't see how that's helping them make impact and that they want to spend that money elsewhere. And we really believe that facilities are core to how nonprofits do their work. So starting with the moment that your client walks in the door and how they experience uh, your organization, um, how they see the space and uh, thinking about staff and um, both hiring the staff the staff retention, and then how staff are able to work with the clients that are in this space. And uh, we see that when nonprofits are, um, you know, squeezed into spaces that are too small, are, uh, you know, fixing their toilets or have ceiling tiles falling on them, that all of those things really impact how you do your work and that they can really slow down, um, you know, your ability to thrive and to grow um, as an organization. Uh, that also it's how you show up in your community that when you invest in your facilities, whether you lease space or whether you own space that you are participating in your neighborhood and your community. And that by helping nonprofits who are working in communities have strong facilities that we're helping the neighborhood um, and helping those communities. And last that uh, facilities can really be an asset for an organization financially as we you know, go through experiences like COVID and have other financial stressors that having your own space that you own and control means that you don't have to worry about where you find the rent bill next month and that they can um, be something that you can you know, pull on and that planning for the future and how your facility can support your organization can really help you financially um, to be a better financially strong organization, more resilient, which is a word we hear so much about these days. So when we're providing real estate consulting to help nonprofits 
plan projects who are really focused on how they can make impact with their facilities and how those facilities can support them financially to be a stronger, better organization. Um, and that's the approach we bring to uh, both planning projects for the future. So here's just a few of the ways that we work with nonprofits to plan projects is looking at different facility options, looking at existing buildings that a nonprofit's in and whether they're serving them today, whether they can improve or whether they should look at other um, buildings in their community. And then looking at buildings that they do a site search to help them understand what they would have to do to a building renovation wise um, to be able to uh, use that building for their program. And then providing what are often described as owner's representative services to help a nonprofit plan and execute a project. You know, generally, there's two reasons that nonprofits consider using a consultant to help them with a, a facility project. One is just the time in the day. So how do you add on a facility project to all the other things that you're already doing um, as a nonprofit executive or as a board member and finding the time to be able to um, execute that on top of everything else. And so uh, we really you know, want to support an organization, find those hours in the week to be able to do that and to do everything else. And so that they don't have to drop something in order to get their facility project done and to allow them to grow. And secondly is bringing the technical expertise. Emily, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So um, what we bring when we work with an organization is nonprofit expertise around how nonprofits um, underwrite, how they uh, plan for cash flow, and um, financially think about their uh, you know, facility project and supporting them. So we only you know, really focus on nonprofit work, so really understand that um, you know, the way that you plan for financials for a nonprofit might be different for a for-profit and want to bring that to supporting a facility project and also bringing sector expertise. So there's a lot of very unique facility requirements that happen in the nonprofit spaces. If you think about early childhood education, if you think about healthcare, if you think about schools and housing, community spaces, that many of those have something going on in the facility that uh, there's better ways to design it where they're more collaborative, um, they're safer, they're healthier, they have more impact to the children who are being served in those classrooms. And so because we do those projects day in and day out, we can really bring something new to uh, approaching those projects. So as a real estate consultant, we work with nonprofits to um, be able to plan and execute those projects and uh, you're serving the Midwest. Um, and I think the next slide, Emily. I think go one, one more slide. I think just an example of how we do that, we're gonna hear from Dennis Mondero, um, who's worked with us in our Chicago office. Um, but another example is um, the North London Employment Network, which uh, completed a capacity building program that received financial management training um, that Dennis Mondero's organization also received in real estate project planning. So providing technical assistance to help nonprofits be stronger and to grow. And then when they have planned a project to be able to execute that project, looking at different facility options, examining buildings and understanding what the different buildings offered them and what the limitations were, and then being able to execute those real estate projects and bringing in bridge loan financing to help support the um, funding of it. So a capital campaign and allowing the organization to get the project started sooner instead of waiting until all the funds were in hand um, and also supporting them while they obtain complicated financing like new markets tax credits. So that's all I have to say. I want to again encourage people to um, reply in the chat box. I do see some questions. Let's see, Kate, may I jump in just yep. for a moment Pardon. about the the North Lawndale Employment Network is a very good example of the way that real estate services and capital solutions, uh, real estate solutions, I should say, and capital solutions at IFF work together. Real estate solutions provided uh, a number of services to this organization, which is a workforce development organization in Chicago. Um, everything from helping them with space planning to now acting as the owner's representative on a very large construction project that they're doing to build a new headquarters, a new uh, office for programming and their administrative offices. They have a large capital campaign that includes grants from the, uh, from the city of Chicago and large contributions from uh, philanthropy. We were able to create a loan to bridge those capital campaigns so that they could undertake that construction and start to build and ultimately finish that project before all the contributions come in so that they are in a position to um, attract even more contributions by showing a finished project. 
And so that is one of the loans that we've made. And when I mentioned uh, the different sizes of loans, I am now working on a $4 million loan for an organization. And earlier in the week, I made a $15,000 loan for a vehicle purchase for an organization to purchase a bus. So that just gives you an idea of the gamut of uh, the range of kind of lending that we do and that we're willing to provide. So. Great. Thank, thanks, Gordon. So um, next person I want you to do is uh, Dennis Mandelo of the Chinese Mutual Aid. And Dennis and I will go back quite a bit in our advocacy path. Uh, while I was, uh, while Joe and the IF was researching who the heck is George Moy, I actually was doing research on who the heck is IFF. And frankly, maybe about 80% of the uh, nonprofits that I talked to have no idea IFF, with the exception of Dennis. Dennis says, George, I don't care what you have to do. You got to get in there because we love IF and more people should know about it. And, and Dennis want to keep it a secret so that he can exclusive to IF, but uh, I'm here to tell the Western world, Dennis, and maybe you can share why you are so in trend and working with IF. Dennis? Hey, thanks so much, George. Um, and uh, Gordon, Kate, uh, Joe, it's a pleasure to be on a panel with all of you. Um, <clears throat> so I first um, uh, encountered IFF um, when uh, prior to being executive director at Chinese Mutual Aid, I was on the board of Chinese Mutual Aid and IFF was uh, um, our consultant on a prior fe facility feasibility analysis. And I think that was in 2011 for Chinese Mutual Aid. Um, and then in 2013 or thereabouts, I became executive director and I actually reached out to Kate Ansors <laughs> and said, hey, Kate, uh, I'm executive director here now. And I wanted to talk about uh, what we had done with uh, IFF on the prior engagement. Um, I, as I mentioned to George, when he asked me, who is IFF? I said, and I think my words were, they are for real. They're the real deal. They're legit. Uh, yes, if you could get on the board, get on the board, that would be such an impact for the AAPI community. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I say this because Kate has been a professional and everyone I've worked with at IFF has been such a professional through and through. Uh, they have helped inform CMAA on how we could have a comprehensive, thoughtful, capital planning strategy for our agency. Um, and in fact, uh, our board uh, just had a recent board retreat, right, as boards do. And um, for example, uh, in, in our, as each department uh, manager or director was reporting to the board on what they're doing, what they intend to do, one of the things that we talked about, like our youth department, um, our, our youth manager, Margaret Smith, we talked about X, Y, Z things of what we currently do. And then we also mentioned like, hey, you know, like some board members have asked about early childhood development. And we don't want to, uh, at this stage, go into early childhood because of X, Y, Z uh, issues, regulatory issues. And a lot of that information that our, our youth department manager was talking about, I had learned firsthand about, uh, I was I was cautioned about it by Kate. Uh, and she said that hey, if you're going to go into early childhood, that's something that you probably want to get an existing partner that's successful in that space because there's so much uh, that you have to do. Uh, and, and so like it, it is capital planning uh, for your organization, but it also leads into what is your programmatic planning. Uh, because uh, in fact, going to the 2011 um, analysis that was you know led by the former executive director, you know, like one of the things that we uh, had was like, like our, our staff had formally asked for like a gymnasium, right? And uh, I remember having this conversation, Kate, and, and, and we talked about, well, do we really need a gymnasium and like for basketball? And, and, and the question that Kate posed to uh, us and our team, and she always poses is like, you know, you could build a facility, but then how do you monetize uh, the facility? How do you continue to pay for it so that that way you're not uh, building a white elephant and then you're in a lot of debt and then you cannot uh, create enough sustainable services to uh, fund it. So, so we don't want to do anything real estate related without uh, like looking at uh, getting the good counsel of Kate and everyone at IFS. So, um, and, and then on top of it, um, actually one other thing I, I do want to mention is that for some folks uh, and, and uh, you know, like you, you'll think, well, how do we, qualify to get IFF services? How do we pay for IFF? And 
we were fortunate that in a couple different times, uh, we, we wrote grant proposals and asked for uh, a grant to help pay for the consulting services for IFF. So um, uh, both for, even right now, we are currently um, working with IFF because we have been funded uh, the, through the state capital bill, through the efforts of State Senator Ram Villavalam, he championed getting us $4 million in the Illinois capital bill uh, to create an eventual Asian American Pan-Asian Center. Uh, and so uh, uh, IFF has been working with Chinese Mutual Aid, uh, who was awarded the money, and our hopeful potential partners, Indo-American Center and HANO uh, Family Alliance, uh, a South Asian Indian organization and a Korean organization in Chicago. We're trying to create a, a comprehensive Pan-Asian uh, center. Uh, and again, we are doing uh, that uh, uh, space plan analysis with Kate and her team, and uh, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is paying for uh, the due diligence on that. So, so love. I love IFF. <laughs> I love your story, Dennis. It's um, one of the challenges most uh, nonprofit has, Asian American aside, is finding the money to do the future planning by professional. Not to say the uh, the nonprofit staff are not professional, but in this particular space it would be wonderful to have quote-unquote sponsors, and the sponsor could be bank, could be other organization to provide the money needed to do professional services. So it's set for the future. Get that, uh, Shiling Chen? I'm just, you know, hinting. <laughs> so with that, um, I, I really appreciate the information share. Uh, I want to uh, make sure we have some time for questions. And um, I'm gonna open the floor out to everyone uh, in, in the audience here. See if you have any questions, any question at all. I did catch two bass today, if you wanna know. Okay, I am patient. I'm looking for questions. Have you been listening? You know, like uh, they're all good moderate, you all have good questions set aside. One of the questions I, I wanna pose uh, to Dennis, maybe other could learn is, how do you go about getting sponsorship? Not to mention the Chase name too often, but why would you give you money to pay for a service? And what was that process like for you as a nonprofit to get sponsorship of these professional services, Dennis? Uh, sure, and, and some, sometimes uh, some grantors, uh, grantors uh, will look to, uh, they're, they're willing to give direct assistance to uh, your direct social services. Like, and, and you see that even now with the pandemic, where um, well, one of the, it's not um, the um, a foundation per se, but right now, like the city of Chicago uh, has given Chinese mutual aid half a million dollars that we could give out directly to low income community members impacted by COVID, right? So oftentimes we can get some grants on that, but a lot of um, grantors are also looking to uh, make sure that that people have the capacity and can increase capacity, you know, to, to go from good to great, right? And, and you can make that statement, like how do we take our nonprofit organization that uh, we have a great mission, we have great people involved both on staff, our board, stakeholders, but how do we perform like a high performing nonprofit? And, and that's what's been so, uh, in, in fact, the Strengthening Nonprofits Initiative that uh, IFF was teaching uh, 10, like I was part of a cohort of 10 nonprofit organizations. The uh, North Lawndale Employment Network was one of the other 10. Brenda Palms Barber is amazing superstar, but, but we were, they, they were selected 10 organizations that knew their game, but how could we all up it so that we could like better leverage our resources and have a higher permanent social impact on the community, right? And so, so that's why being strategic about how you take your money, don't put everything necessarily into the services of the day, but how do you put some of it into the infrastructure so you could like get that bigger return in the long run? And, and that's what, what's important about making sure you're writing those grants uh, uh, grant applications to get funding to help to, to have the IFFs of the world come in and help you build that capacity. Oh, that's a fantastic. 
So Joe, maybe we should talk about this cohort thing, idea to uh, to create a cohort for maybe one or two Asian American nonprofit from different um, different region that you cover. Uh, we could talk about it offline, huh? You want me to? I I can answer that now. We um, Chase has has made a grant to IFF to actually bring SNI into a number of our Midwestern offices in other cities. So we have already kicked that off in Detroit and have already had one cohort and we're soon um, be, uh, I think have an RFP out for another cohort soon. And All then right. eventually we will be bringing that to St. Louis, um, Indy, uh, Cleveland and Columbus as well. And we're having some other conversations about other cities. Oh, and in addition, we, we just did a new cohort in Milwaukee. So okay. we're, we're, we're on it. We're on it, George. All right, let me know uh, next one. And I have a nomination for somebody from Detroit. <laughs> I wonder who. <laughs> I wonder who, right? So uh, Miss Miss Chen, uh, stay in touch with Joe. Make sure we get you in there. So uh, I, do, I do see uh, questions here from the audience. I don't want to be exclusively George Moore's question. How does IF determine what project to take on? This is from Jay Jen. Uh, which one of your IF? Well, I, I'll jump in on that question. I saw that in there. Um, so yeah, for the question about borrowing from IFF, then, um, you know, we are generally looking for projects that uh, can demonstrate their feasibility, um, so to speak. And so there are questions about what is your history of financial operations and what are your plans for the projects and being able to demonstrate the ability to pay back the money that you'd be borrowing. So there'd be questions about that um, that we would ask when we're reviewing it. For real estate projects, um, we are a fee-based consultant. And so um, it's really more of a question about whether the scope we're providing is uh, you know, the right fit for you and the ability to pay for it. Since we're a nonprofit, we keep our costs really low um, to make it affordable. And like Dennis talked about, there are sometimes a grant sources available to either reduce our costs or we'll work with an organization to help make a pitch to one of their funders um, and the work that they do about why that real estate work would maybe help them grow their programming. Um, but so I, if it's a nonprofit project on the real estate side, then it's really just, you know, making sure that it's the right fit for your organization. And then you decide if you want to move forward with it, if it's one of our regional footprints. That's great. I like the idea of you helping them find the money to pay for your services. That's great. Uh, Katie, let's... You're right, George. On, on the lending side, we do want to start with the not-for-profit. What is your project? We want to talk to you. We want to hear about what, what you want to achieve. But then we also want to see, is it financially sustainable? The last thing we want to do is put debt on your balance sheet that you're going to have to struggle in order to make those payments. There certainly are, are times and places when you do want to borrow the money, and it makes more sense to uh, to buy a building that you've been leasing space in, for example. But we do want to look at your historical financial statements and your budget going forward, talk with you, make sure this is something that you're going to be able to afford. And ultimately, our goal is for not-for-profits to own their own assets free and clear of any debt so that they're able in, in the future, if they want to, to leverage those assets uh, for, uh, for future projects, but to be free of all the debt and that's what we're really trying to, we're trying to help them grow, but also not burden them with debt that, that's gonna be a struggle to afford. Great. That's hey, a question? Yeah, there's, there's another question. Let me just read off this. Can I um, ask a question? No. <laughs> no. Go, ahead. go ahead. Okay, just wearing my other hat. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just that uh, for, some, for the initial work, um, would that be also be um, you know, a fee involved? You know, for you to just come to us to understand, you know, our stories and then know our structure, our board, you know, and our financial stand, things like that, and then decide whether we can go further. So would that part be uh, free of charge or yeah. it's a... Uh, and certainly to inquire about whether a loan is the right fit for your organization and understand what your capacity to borrow is that it wouldn't cost anything. And then same on the real estate, just to understand like how we can work with you and I do a lot of free technical advice just to people on like what are their options and what could they do before we get to a stage where they're actually doing fee-based consulting. Good question. Yes, Good question. We, we, we don't charge anything to, uh, to, for you to make an application for a loan. 
and we can take a look at your financial statements and help you determine how much debt can you afford. Uh, and that and that's a service that we provide for free. There's no cost to you for that. Yeah, because uh, I, I would say this is a, a very common mindset for a lot of nonprofit. When they hear borrow money, they just don't want to hear it. You know, it's just a, not something they want to, they will be very interested. Yeah, especially, especially the Asian community. We tend to <laughs> want to be self-help. Uh, and, and, and God and I have this conversation. We, we certainly don't want to impose that on folks they can't afford to pay back because that doesn't do IF any good either. Let me see if they... Um, yeah, I'll just, to add on that, I mean, we see a lot of organizations that there's a pride in not taking on debt. There's pride in being able to raise the funds. And, you know, one thing I think to think about is, you know, how can a bridge loan work for you? So we have loans that don't have prepayment penalties. And so you can borrow and get your project done, you know, six, 12, 18 months sooner than you might have been able to otherwise. And that allows you to open up your doors and start making impact all the sooner um, and to be able to then pay that money back as you're doing your capital campaign. I, okay, I also wanna question. make a point as well in terms of the, the calculations of why ownership, right? And, and this has been a fundamental belief of IFF from our inception in 1988, which is um, we want not one of the best ways for nonprofits to build net assets and net assets in many ways are a sign of financial strength is th is through fully amortizing loans now yes you can capital campaign for that absolutely and we're never looking to to replace um the ability for a capital campaign but often that's just not possible and so responsible borrowing again is part of responsible business management for profit businesses borrow money all of the time. And yes, you're absolutely right, Shenlin. There is this sometimes a stigma around borrowing dollars in the nonprofit sector that, that, you know, again, we understand that. And yet we're still trying to encourage faster ownership because A, you start to develop not um, you start to develop net assets. It's also very important because in almost all states in the Midwest, when you own um, and you have a charitable purpose, you're property tax exempt. So you really should think about it when you're making those lease payments, you are paying for property taxes to the landlord. And when you own, you don't pay property taxes. So you're actually saving um, money by owning. And that has been a part of our calculation. And again, Kate's team, Gordon's team, those are the kinds of conversations that we want to have with nonprofits, big and small, in order to still decide that that is the responsible thing to do. Absolutely, but there are numbers of benefits. Great, thank you, thanks, Joe. I got three more questions. I'm going to try to answer them all before we close out. Hopefully, the first one is uh, from Wei. What are your advice for new nonprofit or startup? I guess startup nonprofit, maybe. Uh, yeah, right. That's, that's a very good question. I should mention from from the lending side, um, we are we rarely lend to a startup organizations. Um, startup organizations, I think, are, are advised not to be starting out by taking on debt. You want to establish yourself uh, and and get a, a, a track record for delivering the services that you do without having the burden of having to meet debt payments. There are really only two. Um, areas in which we do finance startups. Uh, one of those is charter schools. Many charter schools are startup organizations, and that is one that we're very active in financing. But we want to see uh, uh, five years worth of budget projections and a business plan and see a market analysis to see that this is really something that looks like it's going to succeed. The other startup, and I mentioned, or I forgot to mention that we do a couple of uh, for-profit, lending for for-profit organizations, one of those is financing healthy foods, say a grocery store that's willing to locate in a food desert. Um, we are doing what we can to try to uh, eliminate food deserts uh, in this country and provide healthy food alternatives for people that live in communities that are presently food deserts. So that is one where we would look, uh, we would be willing to consider financing a startup organization, a startup grocery store or other uh, provider of healthy foods. But typically, um, we don't finance startup organizations. Okay, I have a, actually a question came in the Q and A. 
I'm going to go ahead and read it. I don't know if you guys can see it. How would IFF structure a working capital line for a nonprofit government account receivable as collateral? Sounds like a banker's question. But yes, we, we, do, we, we have never financed working capital lines of credit, and, and we still don't finance those kinds of uh, lines of credit against account receivable. I get that question often. Um, organizations are wanting to borrow against the account receivable they have under government contracts or, or whatever. Um, we, we have never been in that business, and we continue not to do working capital lines of credit with one exception where we do what we call kind of permanent working capital. If an organization has a significant amount of equity in a piece of real estate that it owns, and they would like to borrow against that equity. Um, and then we will consider making, uh, but it's not a revolving line of credit. It would be a line of credit based on the equity that's in that, in that property. Great. Uh, it's four o'clock, but I'm gonna ask everyone to give me a couple more minutes. So I'll get answer the last questions. Uh, from Hamilton Chen, my good friend, uh, who actually is uh, helping me with Asian American uh, outreach. Uh, do you get bought in by other visibility consultants for senior living or memory care? So that's IF of what was senior living and- Yeah, I, so I'll answer that. Um, so we do work a lot with uh, affordable housing. And so we sometimes work with senior housing, which um, often is funded with something called low income housing tax credits. Um, we develop units ourselves that are serving people with disabilities and are scattered throughout communities. And we also work with people who are planning those projects and we provide loans, pre-development loans to people who have an award of low-income housing tax credits. Um, I have done some work in, uh, in actually in the Asian American community in Chicago around a senior building um, that was looking to refinance. And so was trying to access capital to do a renovation and to plan for the future. And so we helped them. It was a, a board of um, uh, you know, a lot of committee members and they didn't understand exactly how low income housing tax credits could be used. And so we helped explain what our different financing solutions for the organization, act as a real estate consultant, and then helped match them up with the developer who they're now moving forward with accessing federal financing to uh, recapitalize that project. Um, and occasionally see other types of, um, like you said, memory care and other types of specialty um, housing that show up in our work. Um, where we really try and bring in, you know, the best practices of design around that. So occasionally, yes. Great. Hopefully we answer your question, Mr. Hamilton Chen. So yeah, um, we're close to, uh, we actually passed four o'clock, like the close on time, but I want to close by saying thank you for National Ace and the entire National Ace team for co-hosting, providing the Zoom platform, and obviously our speakers, uh, IAF and uh, Dennis Mandero. And last person, I should be the first person, as a Frank, is my uh, partner, Jay Lowe. I know, I, I should spell your name, Jenny Lowe. I, be, I have to be respectful of the White House Commissioner. But Jay Lowe, thank you very much. And uh, I want to let you guys know that um, the next, uh, we're working on a couple other events, but the next one is going to be fun, which is the uh, Asian American Network Holiday Party. And you all will be getting invitation. It'll be virtual somehow. But uh, thanks again, everyone. And we're going to close by um, Emily. Do you, uh, any last? Uh, anybody have last uh, questions? Uh, uh, point that you want to make before we close out? Emily, going to push the button. I F. No. Okay, Emily, you can shut us down. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. And we.